spine one, degenerative disease, deformity, and related conditions. This is for the PA program ortho room block. Uh, these are my disclosures. And acknowledgments to uh, my uh, former colleagues at Temple, Dr. Zizan Sardar and Dr. F. Todd Wetzel, uh, who had given these lectures previously. A lot of modifications, but some of the slides are still from those uh, uh, previous lectures. So learning objectives. You should be able to discuss the pathophysiology, clinical presentation, differential diagnosis, diagnostic tests, surgical, non-surgical, pharmacological, and non-pharmacological treatment, prognosis, and potential complications of the following. So this is from your syllabus. Um, here are the topics for spine. Ankylosing spondylitis. Now this is an inflammatory condition. It's going to be covered in rheumatology uh, portion of this course. Cervical spondylosis. Definitely going to cover that uh, in this lecture. Torticollis, we're going to uh, leave to the reading uh, and up-to-date assignments you were given. Not going to be discussing that here. Definitely going to talk about degenerative disc disease, herniated nucleus pulposus, um, muscle sprain and low back strain. Also going to be something to be covered solely by the reading and not in this lecture. But I am also going to talk about spinal deformity and spondylolysis and spondylolisthesis. Uh, the following, uh, the, the three uh, final topics, fractures, caught equinus syndrome, spinal cord injury, these things, uh, as well as infection, these things are going to be covered in the next uh, lecture in spine uh, two. So let's get, in, let's get into it. So cervical spondylosis. Anything spondy is spine. You can keep seeing this term. So spondylosis is basically arthritis of the cervical spine, uh, often with degenerative disc disease, and this can result in stenosis or narrowing of the neural foramen as well as the spinal canal. And these are two different places. The neural foramen is where you have the nerve or nerve roots, right? And then the spinal canal is where you have the cord, okay? And uh, of course, if you have narrowing in the foramen, nerve root can get compressed. And in the spinal canal, the cord can get compressed. So this can cause neck pain radiculopathy, so of course radiculopathy is nerve roots, and then myelopathy is the cord. Or when you get nerve root irritation, you can get radiculopathy, and when you get spinal cord compression, that can that is called myelopathy or myelopathic symptoms. So very important uh, distinction. So just a little bit of anatomy here. Um, one of the key things to keep in mind is that there are seven cervical vertebrae, right? As seen here, um, C1, which is not shown here, through C7, right? That being said, there are eight cervical nerve roots. So in the cervical spine, and the cervical spine is a very mobile part of the spine, um, and we'll talk about the implications of that when we talk about spinal trauma. Uh, and the nerve roots exit below the vertebra, right? So C5 vertebra, below the C5 vertebra is the C6 nerve root, okay? And then you get all the way up to the point where the C8 nerve root exits above, what is it, T1, okay? So in the cervical spine, the C6 root exits below the C5 bone or above the C6 bone, okay? And you're going to see when we get to the lumbar spine that flips. And we'll, we'll get to that, but the reason is is because there's eight cervical nerve roots, only seven cervical vertebrae, okay? So remember that. Symptoms in cervical spondylosis, limited mobility of the cervical spine, neck pain are very common symptoms. They could get headaches. And we talk about these two things, right? Radiculopathy and myelopathy. So radiculopathy, nerve root irritation, upper extremity pain, numbness, weakness, right? And it's upper extremities because the nerve roots in the cervical spine don't go to the lower extremities. Cervical nerve roots go to the, to the upper extremities. Myelopathy is when you get nerve, uh, I'm sorry, spinal cord compression, right? In the cervical spine. Um, it can cause impaired upper extremity dexterity, but can also cause gait disturbances, and you have to look for these. 
Um, it can also cause abnormal urinary dysfunction. So uh, urinary function, and this is something that you'll have to be sure to uh, ask in your history and um, look for specifically on exam. So on exam, you can look for tenderness, right, along the lateral neck, spinous processes, pain, pain with motion. Uh, you could have abnormal reflexes, motor and sensory dysfunction. Uh, with radiculopathy, you typically have weak motor function if it's bad. And in myelopathy, you're looking for hyperreflexia, right? Upper motor neuron symptoms, if you think about in your neuroanatomy. There is some special testing for myelopathy, as um, shown here. Lermite sign, abnormal gait, tandem walking, Romberg sign, Hoffman reflex, Babinski, you've probably all heard of. We'll show a couple of those. Cervical dermatomes, right? This is like where each nerve root innervates your, uh, for, for, for skin sensation, right? So it's anatomy. It's useful information uh, when you're trying to localize uh, problems. It's definitely good exam question material. I'm not necessarily saying for our exam. It certainly could be, but certainly on um, certifying exams and certainly in orthopedics and neuro neurology and neurosurgery, etc physical therapy, et cetera. The, all, all, all these specialties um, kind of need to know this. So I'm not going to go through all of this. Just take a good look. This is a netter, netter gram. There's lots of other variations on this. Myotomes. So the myotomes are basically which nerve root is best exhibited by which muscle. So C5, a good way to test C5 motor function is to test the deltoid and biceps. Right? For C6, biceps and wrist extensors. C7, triceps, wrist flexion, and finger extension. And then C8, long finger flexors. And then T1 are your so called intrinsics. Right? The intrinsics. Not sure if they, well, you'll hear this term in the, your hand surgery lecture. Um, the inner osseae, uh, abductor digiti minimi quinti, for example. Sperling's test is a test for radiculopathy, okay, for nerve root irritation. What you're trying to do is you're trying to basically extend the spine uh, as well as um, create some lateral rot rotation, and then you're compressing, right? You're compressing down. What you're trying to do is you're trying to create stenosis and uh, like foraminal stenosis and essentially um, cause nerve root irritation, and this person uh, when you do this, may um, may feel uh, a shooting pain, um, kind of uh, exhibiting the or reproducing the radiculopathy symptoms going down the arm, for instance. Lermit sign is uh, a test for uh, myelopathy, where you get a shock-like sensation during this maneuver, radiating down the um, spine, arms, or legs. Hoffman sign um, is an upper motor neuron sign for myelopathy, and we're going to let uh, this video play. You're going to see okay. this. Now, how do you do the other side? Reflexive flexion of the index finger and thumb. You see that? So that is called the Hoffman yeah. sign. So the patient has myelopathy in the cervical spine. This is something that you might find on physical examination. So the Babinski test, um, sorry, I passed that. The Babinski test is another test for upper motor neuron signs, but in the lower extremity, meaning myelopathy or spinal cord injury, for instance, in the lower extremity. Babinski response, if present, the great toe will flex and the small toes will fan out. So, this is a response. Which is exactly what happened here. One more time. And sort of a, almost like abduction. So, let's say the Babinski response is present. That's a you can hear that with the normal sign, a similar stimulus is applied. Lateral aspect of the foot and across the toes. It's a normal response that you would see exactly. in a patient who's intact. Okay. Shouldn't miss anything. Okay. 
So question time. So under which pedicle does the C6 nerve root emerge? And you got to remember what we talked about. Uh, there are eight nerve roots, seven vertebrae, right? So C6 comes out under, the C6 nerve root comes out under the C5 vertebral body, right? So under or distal to or slide back a couple of uh, slides and you'll see the uh, anatomy demonstrating this. Next question, what would be consistent with a C4, C5 disc herniation? Okay, so now you're thinking about motor function. So you got you got to now first you got to think um, where are we talking about uh, you know where's the herniation um, involving? Let's talk about like we're we're getting the exiting nerve root. Let's just say so it's a far lateral disc herniation. You're getting the exiting nerve root. What's the myotome for the nerve you're worried about? Right, biceps weakness. So it's C5, right? At the C4, C5 level, you're looking at C5 as the exiting nerve root if a far lateral disc herniation. And I'll talk about disc herniations a little later in the lecture, so you'll see what I'm talking about with far lateral. Um, but the exiting nerve root here is C5. The myotome for C5 that you test for typically is biceps, right? So biceps weakness. I think this is the last one. Numbness over the little finger and weakness of DIP, distal interphalangeal joint flexion of the index and middle finger. Okay, that's your long flexors of the fingers, right? Numbness over the little finger, that's the ulnar side of the hand. Um, and if you think back to your dermatome, I'll picture some slides back. You know, what is the dermatome for that? Okay, C8, right? So C8. Dermatome is the lateral side or the ulnar side of the hand, or I should say not lateral side, but just the ulnar side of the hand, um, and uh, weakness with uh, long finger flexion, or the long flexors of the fingers. Okay, uh, diagnostic testing. You can certainly get C-spine x-rays. Uh, you may see bony reactive changes, osteophytes, signs of arthritis, right? Uh, you can sometimes recognize with the appropriate measurements cervical canal stenosis. You can definitely, on uh, an extra like a lateral film, identify subluxation of vertebrae. Like is one vertebrae going this way with respect to this one going this way? Like you normally should see a nice, you know, nice line cascade, and you shouldn't have like one vertebral body sitting like out here, right? Disc space narrowing can certainly identify. So here you can see, maybe you can consider this a normal disc space. And here I would say, down here, this is narrowed at the C5-6 interval. Uh, MRIs and myelograms are also helpful. And sometimes an EMG can be helpful, especially if you're trying to distinguish from other conditions like uh, extremity nerve root compression, like a carpal tunnel syndrome. Okay, here are some x-rays. You can see osteophytes here slight um, uh, or definitely some uh, degenerative changes. Here you can see an MRI scan on the left with cervical spondylosis and uh, a myelogram here uh, on the right hand side. Here's a, a sagittal MRI showing some spondylitic changes through the mid cervical spine here. You can see the white here is the spinal fluid. The gray here is the spinal cord and you can see um, multiple areas where the spinal cord is in a very uh, tight space and you certainly can be getting some spinal cord compression at those areas if severe. Okay and here you can see sometimes where you can get a disc herniation uh, compressing a portion of the spinal cord or exiting nerve root. What's your differential? Well a lot of times a patient comes in with neck pain and there's a section in your reading that talks about how to approach the patient with neck pain you have to remember, I mean, the neck's not that far from the shoulder. And a lot of times, uh, a lot of shoulder pathology, and we'll just use that as a catch-all term um, for many different conditions of the shoulder, can certainly um, mimic um, cervical spondylosis, as can peripheral nerve root entrapment, like carpal tunnel disease, cubital tunnel uh, syndrome, vascular issues like thoracic outlet syndrome, as well as uh, more uh, rare conditions like spinal cord tumors. Treatment. Well, most will improve by six, uh, I'm sorry, eight weeks uh, with NSAIDs and physical therapy. Um, surgery can be considered for failure of conservative treatment, certainly intractable pain, 
progressive neurologic findings, right? So this is the thing that you're, you're, you know, you check for on when you do serial exams on a patient. And then importantly, symptoms of myelopathy and spinal cord compression. So remember, I try to have you make this distinction between radiculopathy and myelopathy. Myelopathy means the cord's being compressed. That's the kind of thing we usually don't sit on for too long. So whereas a radiculopathy, we will try to exhaust um, conservative measurements as much as possible, uh, we usually don't mess around with myelopathy. Okay, and sometimes surgery can involve fusion procedures, um, decompression stabilization. Adverse outcomes can uh, include opioid dependence, unfortunately very common with uh, patients with uh, neck and back pain and uh, spinal um, pathology. NSAID complications, so okay, you don't use your opioids, you go to NSAIDs and now you have complications from NSAIDs. Uh, and of course, neurologic um, complications, loss of nerve root function and um, quadruparesis from progressive uh, stenosis due to uh, untreated spinal cord compression. So um, remember, distinguish radiculopathy from myelopathy. And um, I'm going to pause here and um, stop the video, pick up the rest in the next video, continue the lecture. Thanks.